I am so thrilled to be here with you uh, today. It's an honor uh, to speak uh, before you, um, especially given that this is my second book. Um, my first book, The Warmth of Other Sons, um, I was cannot say how thrilling it was um, to be chosen by uh, many uh, universities and colleges uh, for the uh, first year reads, uh, common reads. Um, I remember one um, visit particularly to the University of Northern Iowa um, that chose The Warmth of the Suns uh, for its freshman read. And um, there was a tremendous amount of excitement on the, on the campus at the time because they were converting the book into a play. Um, and I found it uh, so inspiring uh, to see that this campus that um, did not actually have a lot of, um, a very large African-American population had managed to cast the play nonetheless. And it was a beautiful thing to see uh, how excited they were. So that was one of the things that was done with The Warmth of the Sons, my first book. This second book, Cast uh, the Origins of Our Discontents, is not a book that I, I really wanted to write. Um, it was a book that I wished did not need to be written. Um, but as we have seen in recent months and years uh, that um, we and uh, the rest of the world have seen how necessary it is to begin to try to understand the origins of our divisions and the origins of our discontents. And that was the reason why I felt that there needed to be uh, this book, um, particularly after Charlottesville, where we saw um, uh, you know, the divisions uh, come to life in a way that was so, so very disturbing um, and bringing together uh, systems of oppression that we might not have ever connected before. And so that's what set me on the journey, um, continued the journey of talking about um, language that we don't, um, we're not accustomed to hearing applied to our country. The language of caste is the language that we would consider um, applying to, of course, India, um, as uh, the author of A Burning clearly is uh, making reference to. Um, we think of it for maybe feudal Europe, but we don't necessarily think of it for ourselves. And yet this is a word that anthropologists have applied to the United States, particularly to the, uh, the Jim Crow South, and uh, that has risen uh, in, in a dialogue, particularly among scholars. But this is a time I feel and certainly felt um, that it needed to go beyond uh, the academy and to be able to enlighten us all as to a different way of seeing our country's infrastructure and the origins of our divisions. The book has been out for six months and um, it has uh, had an effect that I never ever would have imagined. Um, it's kept me on a virtual book tour for the entire nonstop really since it came out. And it's also turned out that um, colleges and universities have been holding their own events about this book completely independent of Random House or, or myself. And it, it is, it's both inspiring and, and at times uh, stress inducing because we'll see a reference to a book talk and it'll have, you know, the photo of the book and photo of myself and uh, it's, it's very, it's lovely to see uh, the excitement over it, but then it will set um, some stress because then I'll, I'll have to ask, I'll say, am I, am I scheduled to give a talk at Bryn Mawr on Tuesday? <laughs> and it turns out, no, I, I, I'm not. Uh, they, they did this on their own. Um, the answer is we cannot keep up with the, um, with, the, with the excitement and the energy that it has sparked. And essentially, it has taken on a life of its own. One of the uh, uh, people that uh, introduced me at one of the events that I did for a virtual event um, said, with in all good cheer, he said, you know, uh, we have been through so much in this country. We have been through, we are in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, we um, have experienced uh, what, what happened, the horror of watching what happened to George Floyd. We are in the midst of, of, of an election, uh, a, a fraught election. And then in August, you come and you drop cast on us. And I said, I said to him, well, I did not, I, I did not drop cast on, 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 on you or anyone else. Cast is here, cast is evident. Um, cast is with us whether we choose to recognize it or not. 
It is a part of our country's infrastructure dating back to the time of enslavement, 1619, going back uh, to the creation of a hierarchy on the soil that first, uh, first uh, meant uh, decimating the numbers of, of indigenous people and then bringing in uh, people uh, to be enslaved, people from Africa to be enslaved, to build this new nation out of wilderness, such that before there was the United States, there was actually slavery and thus the origins, the, the infrastructure, the foundation of what would be the, the divisions that we have seen in the current day. Again, as I said, that the word caste is not a not language that we're accustomed to, to hearing. And yet um, one notable American, one very, very important American that, that we often um, honor this time of the year, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King came to the recognition when he made his first trip to, to India in the winter of 1959. Uh, he'd always wanted to go to, to India. It had, it had been there that um, he, uh, you know, was so inspired by the nonviolent protest philosophy of Mohandas K. Gandhi, and he'd always wanted to go to India. So he made this historic trip there with his wife, Coretta Scott King. They were visit, they were received as visiting dignitaries. And at a certain point, he made a, a trip to the southern part of the country in order to um, meet with um, people who were from uh, the uh, the subordinated lowest caste in the in the country. Uh, he went to visit a school where the students were from families that were then known as untouchables, now known as Dulles. And uh, upon arrival, the the principal was very excited to introduce him to the students, and he said, "Young people, I wish to introduce you to a fellow untouchable from the United States of America." And when Dr. King heard that language applied to him. He first bristled at it. He, he was a bit peeved, in fact, to be described as an untouchable. He did not see himself as an untouchable. He had uh, been greeted as a visiting dignitary, dignitary uh, upon uh, arrival in India. He had had dinner with the prime minister, so he did not view himself as an untouchable. Of course, we know he was an extremely learned man and he was the leader of the liberation movement of African-Americans um, in the United States. So he did not see himself that way. But then he thought about it. He thought about what was then 20 million uh, black people in the United States. Um, the, the majority of them uh, who were in the, in the Southern part of the United States were being held in a fixed place, prohibited from voting, prohibited from participating in the, pub, in the uh, body politic, prohibited from um, public accommodations and their efforts to uh, be recognized as the true citizens that they had always been were being met with tremendous violence. Uh, at that very moment, that was what was happening uh, back in the United States. And so he thought about it and he said, I am an untouchable and every black person in the United States is an untouchable too. There at that moment, uh, Dr. King came to the recognition that the place that he was visiting um, saw they were following very closely the civil rights movement, were aware of what was happening in the United States and that the people who knew caste best, the people who were at the bottom of the Indian caste system, the Dalits, uh, then known as untouchables, they recognized caste when they saw it and they recognized the parallels between their own hierarchy and what they saw going on in the United States. And so he came to that recognition as well. And then um, many, many uh, 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 years later um, in working on the warmth of the suns, I became aware of the work of anthropologists as they were describing the Jim Crow South, a place where it was actually against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham. You could go to jail if you were caught playing checkers with a person of a different race. It was a place where um, the very word of God, the Bible itself was segregated in courtrooms throughout the South. There was actually a black Bible and an altogether separate white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court. The same sacred object could not be touched by hands of different races, evoking, that, that was just one small, one, one example of the uh, evoking of one of the pillars of caste, which is purity versus pollution. The idea that the dominant caste uh, has to protect itself or feels it must protect itself from the potential pollution that could accrue from proximity to those who are deemed beneath them. The idea of this longstanding hierarchy uh, of division 
which is evoking the idea of caste. Caste is an artificial, arbitrary graded ranking of human value in a society that determines standing, respect, benefit of the doubt, assumptions of, of competence and, and intelligence, access to resources or the denial of access to resources. And this is what is going back all the way to the found, before there was the United States of America with the founding economic, social and political system uh, that grew out of enslavement. We have seen the manifestations of these divisions in our current era. Um, in May, we saw, uh, we saw a man, we saw George Floyd killed before our very eyes over the assumption uh, of his having presumably attempted to pass uh, a, a um, counterfeit $20 bill. We saw, we saw him killed before our very eyes. And then uh, only uh, at the start of this, this very young year, uh, we saw the capital of the United States breached and a rampage, uh, a mob rampaging through the citadel of democracy. We saw a Confederate flag uh, uh, in the Capitol Rotunda and in Statuary Hall. We have seen these, uh, the, these, uh, the, the ways that hierarchy is persisting in our current era in terms of the responses to, uh, to whatever a person may do, how a person is responded to in our society based upon their ranking, their assumption, their uh, positioning in a caste system. And what this calls upon all of us to do is to finally reckon with and to learn and address the, uh, the history that we've inherited. Because we don't know our history, we speak of slavery as a, a sad, dark chapter in our country's history. Far too many people think of it as a sad, dark chapter of our country's history, when in fact, it was the foundation of our country's political, social, and economic system. Slavery went on for so long that it will not be until uh, next year, 2022, that the United States will have been a free and independent nation for long as slavery lasted on this soil. That's how long slavery lasted. Another way of looking at it is slavery lasted for so long that no adult alive today will be alive at the point at which African-Americans will have been free for as long as slavery lasted on this soil. That will not happen until the year 2111. That is how long and how enduring and, and as foundational as slavery has been to our country. We have not addressed much less reconciled what we are facing as a country. Uh, we have not begun to begin to really truly understand how we got to where we are but we are not going to be able to make progress unless we recognize what it was that got us to where we happen to be. We saw uh, what happened on January 6th as our country uh, and the world witnessed uh, the, the citadel of democracy being overrun, rampaged uh, by a mob. And we also saw the idea, saw the, the Confederate flag that was delivered to the Capitol farther than Robert E. Lee himself did. We saw that with our own eyes. We have to go and find analogs in other, in other centuries to begin to put into context what we have witnessed just in recent months. And that means that there's so much work that we have yet to do. What we saw may have looked like it was from a different country, but it is our country. What we saw may have looked like it was a different century, but this is our century. And this is a reminder that uh, the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, his mission has yet to be realized, has yet to be completed. And it falls upon those of us alive today, those of us who have inherited these hierarchies that were not constructed by anyone alive today, but which we are currently living under, the responsibility is up to those of us alive today and particularly to the people who are the prime beneficiaries of the caste system, the prime beneficiaries of the hierarchy, descended from those who are the prime beneficiaries of the hierarchy that, we've in, uh, that we have inherited. And it's necessary that we begin to understand our history, not just for ourselves in our time, but for future generations 
for the species and for the planet itself. Thank you so much for including me today. And I do hope that this conversation, um, which is percolating all over the country and on campuses even now, continues in, in a more formal way. Thank you so very much for having me.